In a move to hold government officials accountable for torture, Canada has charged Syrian Colonel George Saloum with allegedly torturing Canadian engineer Mahir Arar. In 2002, Arar was kidnapped by U.S. authorities during a layover at JFK airport and then sent to his native Syria, where he was tortured and interrogated in a tiny underground cell. He was held for nearly a year. This is the first ever criminal charge of torture brought by Canada against a foreign government official for acts committed abroad. After the news was announced, Mahir Arar's wife, Monia Mazir, read a statement from Mahir, who has not spoken to the press in two years. This is by no means the end of the road. It is my hope that George Saloum will be found alive, arrested, and extradited to Canada to face Canadian justice. The laying of this charge comes at a critical point in our history. Canada has lost much of its credibility within the last decade when it comes to supporting important human rights causes. It is my hope that Canada gives high priority to eradicating torture and bringing who's committed it to justice. Enhancing national security and protecting human rights can go hand in hand. Lastly, I would like to quote former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who said, let us be clear, torture can never be an instrument to fight terror, for torture is an instrument of terror. Merci. Thank you. That was Monia Mazik speaking on behalf of her husband, Maher Arar, and we'll be speaking with her in Ottawa in a minute. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police will now attempt to locate and extradite Maher's alleged torturer, Colonel George Saloum. A Canada-wide warrant and Interpol notice have reportedly been issued for his arrest. Canada's decision to pursue torture charges again in Maher's case may open the door to further such prosecutions, including of U.S. government officials. In 2010, Maher Arar appeared on Democracy Now! and described what happened to him. It's a long story, but I was basically stopped at JFK airport, and I was told uh, it was a routine procedure. Eventually, a team of FBI and New York police uh, uh, showed up, and they started asking me questions, and they, they had always told me I was not a suspect. Uh, the the, interest, the uh, questioning lasted for many, many hours on end, and uh, eventually I was arrested. I was not told why, and I, was, I, I spent that night in a, in a, uh, in a, at the airport. I could not sleep. Next day, they asked me to volunteer to go to, to Syria, and then I refused. I was taken to MDC, where I spent about 10 days, and they eventually secretly took me in the middle of the night and shipped me off to Syria like a parcel. And what happened there? Through, through, through Jordan. Well, um, obviously, uh, it was an expedited process. They didn't allow me to talk to a judge, even though I insisted. They, they lied to my, to my, uh, to my lawyer, uh, who my family hired, and they bypassed all the regular procedures. They, they basically uh, did not care when I protested my, my, uh, the fact that I may be tortured when once I'm in Syria. And when tell us what happened to you? Tell us what happened to you in Syria. Well, um, uh, of course, they dumped me in Jordan, a country I have no connection to whatsoever, and uh, it's a known fact now that the Jordanians are cooperating fully with the, uh, fully with the war on terror. And uh, the hours later, they hand me over to the Syrians, and and the. Uh, the the uh, interrogation started that same day. There was no physical violence. The same day, uh, threats and all kinds of verbal threats uh, with electricity uh, and, and the chair. They call it the German chair. Uh, but the beating started the following day, where they start beating me with uh, with, with no advance warning whatsoever, with a, with, a, with a cable, electrical cable. And uh, the, the most intense uh, beating uh, was on the third day, where, uh, for some strange reason, they, they wanted me to say that I've been to Afghanistan. At the end of the day, I, I lost all my, all my strength, and, 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 and I, I told them what they wanted to hear. Um, so the beating uh, did not stop, but it became much, much less in intensity. But, but I can tell in the eyes of the investigators, the Syrian investigators, I don't even know if I can call them that. They're torturers. That they they were looking for something that uh, they, they they wanted to please the the Americans. But but I can tell you after two weeks of of, uh, 
of uh, torture and harsh interrogation and, and, and humiliation, I, I can't tell, tell in their eyes that there was nothing there. Maher Arar, speaking to Democracy Now! in 2010. Well, in 2007, Maher Arar received a $10 million settlement from the Canadian government. The United States has yet to apologize for taking him from Kennedy Airport and rendering him to Syria, where he was tortured for close to a year. From where we go now to Ottawa, Canada, where we're joined by two guests. Monia Mazik is the wife of Maher Arar, the national coordinator as well of the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. And Alex Neve joins us, Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, Monia, can you explain exactly how you found out who Maher's torturer was? Uh, I found out the first time uh, through Meher's, uh, when he came back, during our discussion, um, and we had many, many of them, um, you know, about how he was treated, how he was tortured, how he was kept there. And the name of George Saloum came as basically uh, almost uh, one of the very few, because he, did, he did, doesn't know who were his, like, all of the name of the torturer, but George Saloum came out as one precise one. And what was Maher's uh, reaction, uh, Monia, when he heard uh, that his alleged torturer, this George Saloum, was being charged? Well, uh, I think his first reaction was, I mean, he knew that there was an investigation that started in 2005, um, after one of his lawyers advised him to uh, ask for, uh, you know, to, to uh, have a complaint about uh, that person in particular, or, you know, uh, at least someone who tortured him in Syria. Uh, but that investigation uh, was uh, taking so much time, and uh, Meher was not not sure whether this is going to um, finalize with the concrete action. So he was very much surprised, almost believing that this cannot happen, but uh, eventually it did. And Alex Neve, could you talk about the significance of uh, 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 Maher Arar's uh, alleged torture being charged? Uh, certainly. Well, I and, and many people, Meher and Monia as well, have been using words like historic and groundbreaking and unprecedented, and it truly is on a number of fronts. I mean, first and foremost, it's just hugely significant because of what it means for Meher and Monia and their family in terms of personal justice. But this is an astounding breakthrough in the bigger struggle to end torture. Uh, we know that torture continues in the context of national security, certainly, and otherwise, because of impunity, because torturers get away with it. Well, finally, for the first time ever in Canadian history, uh, Canadian legal provisions, which have existed since 1985, so these have been part of Canadian law for 30 years, have for the first time now been used uh, to charge someone for torture that happened outside of Canada, the first time ever that a foreign government official has been charged for torture under Canadian law. And that's an incredible uh, advance in, in that effort to ensure that people don't escape justice. And it also conveys that very strong message that torture has no role to play in cases where national security supposedly uh, is the motive, that no matter what, torture is a crime. Uh, national security doesn't excuse it or justify it. Torture is a crime, and those who carry it out should face justice. Mm. So, at this point, you don't know where Colonel George Saloum is, is that right? And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are trying to help you find him. Now, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police also were deeply implicated in uh, Maher Arar's being taken to begin with, is that right? So, talk about those two issues, how you begin to find Colonel Saloum. Uh, well, well, uh, maybe I'll do the first, and Monia may want to pick up on the second. Uh, certainly, in in terms of trying to find Colonel Saloum now, obviously it's a challenge. It's a challenge any time a police force is trying to find a foreign suspect. Uh, it's doubly challenging when we're dealing with a country like Syria, which of course has been ripped apart by devastating civil war for over four years now. Who knows if he's still alive? Who knows if he's in Syria? Has left Syria? Uh, but the RCMP is determined to try to find him, and they have turned to. 
Interpol, something that's known as a blue notice, has been issued, which means that police forces around the world now are being asked to stay on the lookout for a Colonel George Saloum, and if they find him. And that could be when he crosses a border, when he arrives at an airport, when he gets pulled over somewhere for a traffic stop. If he comes to anyone's attention, the RCMP will learn about it right away, and they'll take action. How likely is it that that will actually mean that someday he'll be in a Canadian courthouse? Uh, we can't assign any kind of statistical uh, probability to that. Uh, but stranger things have happened, and the RCMP will do everything they can to try to make it happen. So, Monia, if you could respond to this issue of uh, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, being so deeply implicated in your husband's detention and rendition to Syria, and yet they're the ones who are looking for now his torturer, can you explain the background here? Well, I think, um, yes, you're right. Um, Justice O'Connor, the judge who conducted the public inquiry uh, into the action of the Canadian government after uh, what happened to my husband, pointed out to the implication of uh, the RCMP and several other agencies, Canadian agencies, sending erroneous information to the United States on, uh, about my husband. Um, but I think this investigation came because it's it started more I think um, as a legal step as a legal kind of uh, normal thing to do and uh, at that time um, there was a big break into the confidence and relationship between my husband and uh, and the RCMP so uh, but uh, my husband decided to go with that uh, investigation to cooperate to give them uh, whatever information can be helpful uh, we were not sure whether this is going to take us anywhere and um, the fact that it took 10 years um, tell you can tell whoever is hearing and listening about this case is that it's not an easy one it is complex investigation but also there are things happening that we are not aware of and maybe that made the the, the work of the RCMP uh, more difficult and uh, lengthy um, I don't think you know um, we cannot um, today, looking uh, more than 10 years uh, after what happened to my husband, we cannot say, well, you know, the, the RCMP is the culprit. We are not going to talk to them. I think lives move on. And um, what, what is important to remember is that, yes, um, they did something wrong. And uh, now there is this investigation, which is something very positive. What we really need here is more accountability in general. I think Canada lacks that accountability when it comes to its uh, national security agencies. We are uh, almost, it's non-existent. And um, if that case, or if this new uh, announcement tell us something, it's, uh, we cannot really rely on one particular uh, complaint or one investigation to get justice. We really need to change the system put more uh, accountability, more oversight to be able to say that will not happen again to Meher Arar, but also to any other uh, Canadian here in Canada who has been going through this hell. Well, Alex Neve, you suggested earlier that this was a historic uh, uh, case, uh, the, the charging of, of George Saloum. But some have said that it's largely a symbolic act, given the fact, as you also said, that he's Syrian, he's in, in, maybe in Syria, which is, at the best of times, as you pointed out, it's very hard to find uh, a foreign suspects, trace them, on top of which Syria is engulfed in a civil war. Do you think there's any likelihood that some of the people who were involved in, in Meher Arar's uh, rendition and torture closer to home in Canada or here in the United States are likely to face any consequences? Well, I think that's one of the big questions that people have been talking about since the charges were announced, uh, that this is that this tremendously important. And obviously, as, as Monia began uh, in talking about uh, how central uh, George Saloum was to the torture and horrific abuses Meher experienced, it's, it's absolutely vital that he's face, going to face some accountability. But there's so much more. Uh, there's obviously others in Syria, uh, including at higher levels above Colonel Saloum. There's certainly U.S. officials. After all, they're the ones 
ones who handed him over uh, to Colonel Saloum uh, and his fellow criminals to carry out the torture that was conducted. Uh, and even though we've had the accountability that came through the public inquiry into Meher Arar's case here in Canada, there's never been any personal accountability, whether that's criminal, uh, who knows whether there's criminal accountability, but even disciplinary accountability for RCMP and other officials who played a role in getting everything rolling in the first place. Uh, it was bad information. Uh, it was inflammatory accusations that began in Canada that were passed on to the Americans that then ended up making it possible at the end of the day for Colonel Saloum to torture Meher Arar. So this can't be the end. Uh, certainly, we and others will be pressing uh, the RCMP uh, to continue, uh, that what we need to view this is as a door that was long shut, uh, a door uh, that is a doorway to justice and accountability has finally been opened. Uh, and we now need to not just stand at that doorway and look in, we need to walk through the doorway uh, and ensure that this becomes a much more wide-ranging exercise. Monia, the Canadian government awarded your family $10 million in a settlement. Has the U.S. government ever apologized for originally taking Maher at the airport at JFK. And is he does he remain on a terrorist watch list in the United States? Could he could you all fly back into the United States? Um, no, no, actually, both questions, no. Uh, the United States never apologized. I think uh, what was closer, the closest thing uh, that we heard, I remember that was uh, Condoleezza Rice at some point she said uh, something like uh, uh, that file uh, would have been handled somehow different or something. That was the closest thing to apology, if you can call that, or to admission of wrongdoing. Um, my husband tried uh, the legal routes in the United States, uh, and then unfortunately, I think in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, uh, his case was dismissed by the Supreme Court in the United States, and they pointed out to the political level. So I think, uh, which is, I, I agree. I mean, it, it, the decision is political, the war on terror is political, and uh, unfortunately, the court did not uh, and could not have the courage and I think enough uh, uh, courage to go ahead and admit that the system is uh, of rendition, um, is wrong and illegal. Um, when it comes to, uh, I think you asked whether he is on a terrorist watch list or, um, I don't know for sure. Uh, if uh, if he his name still exists there, and the reason is that he doesn't travel to the United States uh, immediately after he came back. I mean, he knew that he was banned to go to the United States, and that banning was re um, um, renewed again. I think after five years. Um, so. I don't want to take. I don't want him to to try because I don't think this is really worth doing. Uh, uh, it's uh, about his health. It's about his life, and uh, um, it is unfortunate now that uh, you know he cannot travel. Period. Uh, not because he knows or he has uh, confirmed information. It's just because of the fear that one day this can be repeated all over him. So um, it's not a joke or, you know, just a speculation or something to take uh, very simplistic. It's uh, a trauma, the whole trauma that uh, is attached to my husband, no matter what are the compensation, what no matter what, uh, uh, you know, the apology, uh, his name has been uh, out there uh, associated with terrorism and with today's all uh, what's going on in the world about uh, terrorism, national security, uh, scrutiny of passengers, everything, um, it's simply impossible to and yet go he back has been and travel. completely cleared by the Canadian government. We're going to have to leave Absolutely. it there. I thank you so much, both of you, for being with us from Ottawa. Moni Mazi, the wife of Meher Arar, and Alex Neve, uh, the head of Amnesty International Canada. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. Thanks so much for joining us.